The 10th century mystic and monk Gregory of Narek is one of the Armenian church's greatest saints. On February 21st, 2015, Pope Francis declared Saint Gregory a doctor of the Catholic Church, placing him in the group of foundational thinkers like Saints Augustine, Chrysostom, Aquinas, Athanasius, Ephraim, and Teresa of Avila. On April 5th, 2018, a statue of Saint Gregory was unveiled at the Vatican and blessed by the Pope, both Armenian Catholicoi and other church leaders participating. What drew Gregory to write about his relationship to God and his church in a way that speaks to the hearts of Armenians and to the church worldwide? To begin with, Gregory grew up in a time of peace. The Armenian kingdoms were about to fall, but in his lifetime, it was still possible to have warm relationships with people of other faiths under a culturally sophisticated, relatively stable government. Gregory grew up around Lake Van, a region dense with remnants of Armenia's most ancient past, as well as monasteries of all sizes. Every one of its harsh and stunning landscapes held reminders of the Armenians' deep roots in the soil and in Christianity. The early death of Gregory's mother changed his life completely. At less than 10 years old, he was sent to study at the monastery of Narek. There he came under the maternal protection of the Mother of God and Saint Santucht, to whom the monastery's churches were dedicated. In one of his prayers, he says tenderly, my spiritual heavenly mother of light cared for me like a son, more than any earthly breathing physical mother could. Gregory's father became bishop of a province south of Lake Van. Unfortunately, this gentle, learned, even slightly pedantic man fell victim to Catholicosal party politics. The terrible injustice of his father's disgrace afflicted Gregory deeply. Adding insult to injury, the same authorities accused Gregory and his cousin of heresy too. The barrage of hurtful, untrue words was very wounding. Chronic poor health inhibited Gregory's life and prayer, frustrating his desire to live fully. Before he lost the battle against his debility at around 50, Gregory had experienced the full range of doubt, bitterness, resentment, and anxiety. His spirit was forged in the fire of negative emotions on the one hand, and the fire of God's love on the other. Knowing how words can wound, Gregory chose to create words that heal. He says in one of his early prayers, if the danger of death besieges a person with physical pain, may he find the hope of life when he prays to you through this book. If anyone is suffering, heart smitten with uncertainty, may she be made whole by your gentleness through these words. Gregory's healing words expressed intense love for three things, the church, the liturgy, and the cross. Understandably, Gregory struggled for years with how to love a church, some of whose members, chief pastors even, acted in cruel and shallow ways. Yet the very failings of church authorities caused Gregory to realize that the church is vastly more than the people who temporarily lead it. In his prayer book, he affirmed, the church is greater than any human being. Like an eternal mountain, she has such great holiness that she upholds no anathema, but graciously pardons those who do not know what they are doing. Gregory's spirit lived through the church's liturgy. His prayers often follow liturgical sequences, and for him, life and liturgy are one. Swinging the censer, Gregory realized that he himself was a censer, that his thoughts were made fragrant by divine love just as frankincense is by the hot coals. Gregory's mystical life 
was also fueled by the cross. We know that Gregory saw his life as a crucifixion because he tells us so, quite frankly. His experience sensitized him to everything that looked or acted like a cross. Some days he felt like an unarmed gladiator. We have all had days like this, days when it seems to us that some force we never wanted to fight is bringing us down. On one very confrontational day, Gregory prayed, cut me loose with your victorious sword of life, the cross, and release me from the nets that have snared me, taken me captive with death on all sides. Gregory often felt crushed. Yes, he chose to accept his role as a bunch of vulnerable grapes thrown into life's wine press. But then, one life-changing moment, he realized that the mechanism pressing down on the grapes was shaped like the cross. And he had the radiant revelation that he was being crushed not by an enemy, but by love. In one verse of Gregory's praise to the Holy Cross, Christ says to him, it is I and I alone who press the grapes. Gregory had not been left to wither on the vine. God found him ripe, ready to be made wine, fit to become the very blood of Christ. For Gregory, death was a continual, vivid presence. He worried that nothing in his insignificant life would count for much in the light of eternity. But when he thought about the scales of the last judgment, he saw that the scale itself is a cross. He asked God in prayer, how would the mass of all the sins of the universe appear to the generosity of your almighty eyes? God responded, in comparison with the cross, all the sins of the world are like a drop of rain that trickles away. In his short life, Gregory discovered God's love within all things, including unjustified, inexplicable suffering. He wrote his prayers to make this discovery available to all, not only to the spiritually adept, exceptional, joyful people, but also to beginners, the depressed, or the simply average. Gregory convinces us, and Christians in every tradition, that human actions never overcome divine grace even if they overcome the laws of nature. God's forbearance, gentleness, redemption, forgiveness, and glory will prevail to all ages and generations. <laughs>